Mr. James. And I'm Mr. Richie. And we are The the Educators. Wow, okay. It's been a long week, or a few weeks, or actually, you saw us last week, so... Long week, right? It a is long week. October 1st, 2020. It is Thursday and COVID hits home. Yeah. So we, uh, we have had COVID visit our school. And uh, so we are certainly um, not you and I, luckily. Um, yeah. the, you know, the, the, the structure, the plan is working, um, which is great, you know, I, I feel because there's uh, probably a good chance that every everyone could have have gotten it if we didn't have some of these things set up in place. So that is some good news um, because I, I taught a class that was involved in in it, and uh, but because of the pre planning, it's working. I like that. I like that um, that all this um, thought going into it um, actually has some results. Yeah. But uh, so we're still right in the middle of the pandemic Mm. Um, in the world. We did see an uptick, uh, weekly increase. So there's 2,075,000 new cases in the last week. In the United States, we are down a little bit, you know, which is good. Um, But still, 286,000 new cases over the last week. Right here in Maine, uh, we're a little bit down. I wouldn't, you know, within the error of margin, I'd imagine. And we came in at 220 new cases in the last week. And at least one of them was really close to home. Yeah, and it's actually two I saw the other day on the news for our state that we had like 54, 55, which is double or triple what we've been, uh, like a little more than double that we've been used to and we're like oh great is, is it what's going on and yep. still that wedding that happened <laughs> we're still hearing about that the effects of that yep oh it's so bad it's it's unfortunate how one's like with this specifically like one small event can change the the outcome for i mean everyone so it's just um it's a thing to be aware of it's it's good to, for us to be uh, focused on you know situation at hand but at least for today we're going to try and and get away from all of the covid stuff we're going to talk about some something that we haven't talked about before on the show um but something we've been looking forward to oh yes and uh that's going to be um how can we live on the moon and why haven't we done it already and what's it going to be like and so yeah. I'm looking forward to that, but uh, that's, that's going to be in the future, in a, coming up in a little bit in another segment. Uh, but first, we're going to do a little bit about uh, science in the news. What did you find out in the news this week? Yes, well, a couple, I mean, it's, you know, everything we've got is, is the good and there's the bad. And what a great segue that we're going to go from talking about these horrible things that are going to be happening to our planet about going off our planet and living somewhere else. (laughs) Let's let's get out of here, but not, you know, but also in a way where, hey, let's explore other things out there finally. Let's just work hard at trying to survive in a very inhospitable place. But uh, first thing, and of course, everyone's heard of murder hornets, these gigantic hornets, uh, Asian giant hornets, murder hornets, could get a hold in the Pacific West Coast in the U.S. So I have they, they said they have a perfect environment for them. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm sure it, it matches, you know, the latitude where they're coming from in Asia. And so, therefore, why wouldn't they, you know? And especially in the, um, everywhere in the north, um, we're in the northeast, but over there in the northwest, I think it was uh, Washington State that had some... Uh, some sightings of these murder hornets and well i mean i'm glad i'm on the other coast just yeah i I heard that they're finding them and if they have to find a a nest somewhere they have to destroy that nest they have to make sure yes they do they're looking for these queens because they're like we cannot let them get out because this is where they could get a hole i mean they're literally people are out there just to find them and destroy them because it's 
the fact that it could be quite a large problem that we have to deal with. And that's yes. just, I mean, these, they're giant and they destroy honeybees, they decapitate them and they, you know, a few of them can just destroy entire honeybee colony. And that's, a, those are our pollinators. That's why we have vegetables. That's why. Yeah. Like, and, and they would, they will do that. They'll decimate a whole, um, colony in like a matter of hours too. Yeah. So they'll move on to the next one. So if, you know, especially if you're in like a popular honeybee area where multiple swarms live, you know, you get one of these guys in the, in the area and they're going to go and get that honey <laughs> and take out every bee in their way. And that's a, uh, it's a big problem, especially when we're, we're already having issues with honeybees and yeah. um, our use of, um, you know, uh, high, a lot of uh, pesticides, uh, pesticides. And stuff, yeah. yeah, and then um, even other things too are harming the bees. We're not doing anything really good for the bees except for those of us that care, and especially those people that are out there hunting down the murder hornets. They're doing a good, a good thing for those bees too. But we need them. We need them for everything. I feel like and, be uh, out there with a uh, a vacuum cleaner just to suck them up, <laughs> get rid of them. Ah, oh. right, but. Another news story, which seems uh, all great, I mean, so there's going to be ups and downs with this, is that the first black hole image that was taken actually last year uh, proves that Einstein was yet again right about his uh, relativity theory. Excellent. I think so. I read about that um, before. I didn't even look that up today, but um, I believe it because it's been tested over and over again, and it's amazing how many people are like you know um, we're gonna we're gonna find some new evidence that's gonna you know prove this you know 80 year old theory out you know out of date and not really any have really put up much of a challenge and it's really cool to see that uh more observations equal more evidence for his theories and um i had a lot of um faith in einstein's theories after i had heard the story about gps have you ever heard about how GPS mm. needed the Einstein equations in order to function. Mm. It so they had launched the G, first GPS satellites, and you know they're buzzing around the Earth at you know over around seventeen to eighteen thousand miles an hour, and um, when they're doing that, you know there's they're sending out radio signals. So in your phone, you get the signals from you know like six or seven different ones of one of those. Uh, satellites at the same time and how it measures your location is by the difference in time all those satellites send a pulse out at time yeah and your phone measures the difference in time from the other satellites and that's you know using math that's that's how they pinpoint your location well they didn't factor in the speed of the of the craft and so like the doppler effect was happening um basically you know like the it was they weren't it wasn't functioning correctly so they yeah. had to put it in the einstein equations that say that the faster you go the slower time goes and all of a sudden like so it was miles off within a few hours the first gps system and then they plugged in this math from einstein that says the faster you go the slower time itself is yeah. and corrected it and now we have the gps that we have today and so you know it doesn't surprise me that einstein gets tested and proved right again because i mean that's a pretty good test right there i like the fact that because of him other people have proposed sort of their their own theories and stuff and they've tested things and if he was proven wrong on something it would sh it would be like the scaffolding holding up all these other theories and they would all crash down and it would be like we're in the dark ages again yeah It'd be so, so when something like that goes right, you're like, great, we can keep going in this direction we've been going in mm -hmm. and other, other things will come about. I mean, that can lead help with artificial intelligence. That can, that's going to help with CERN with their, the giant collider crashing protons and stuff together so we can find out how to make small black holes. It's going to help with everything and we're going to keep moving in the direction we're going in. So is nothing worse than, than spending years of your life working towards something and then finding out, no, nope, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And then, but the, you know, even Einstein, even Einstein himself believed that there was um, a greater equation than the ones that he made because uh, he was looking for a, 
you know, a, a unifying theory. And yeah. I think that um, that's the holy grail right there, a unifying theory that makes quantum physics work with, um, you know, traditional physics, um, then, you know, that's, that's the holy grail. So we'll, we'll keep looking for that. And maybe someday, um, maybe he won't be proven wrong per se, but it'll, see, it'll be like, you know, Newtonian physics, you know, turned, turned into modern physics. But, uh, you know, something like that, maybe. Which is why we need to live forever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> once, once again, we'll keep coming back to that, everybody. I'm yeah. sorry. That's what we're it about. It sucks to put in so much effort, and then all of a sudden you're just like, <clears throat> sorry, uh, time's catching up. Yeah, so put, or just uh, specifically, because it's not like, it's basically one in a million people who can actually get to the level where they can think like that. And... Mm -hmm constantly function and and just output amazing information and, and ideas and solve problems in a, in such a way that's like a savant and yep. we just need those people to last for as long as possible because we need that's humanity to improve and that's going to help us on the moon <laughs> that's right yeah we're, we're getting there we're getting there next news item by 2100 or 2,100, we are going to have Greenland be losing ice at its fastest rate in 12,000 years. That sounds about right. Hook, line, and step with uh, everything else going on with, I mean, at this point, climate change is absolutely not even on the front burner at all yeah. for anyone at this point. And it's really unfortunate because it's, it's real, it's happening, and we're, you know, trying to argue over you know some other basic science things still so unfortunately it's this pandemic has taken a huge chunk out of uh out of um you know climate change not research as well but like just the progress because we've probably never consumed plastic at a higher rate yeah single serve everything you go to a restaurant even for you know takeout or even just for dine in and you sit down and it's single serve ketchups and single serve packets and just all everything is plastic so they can throw it out so they don't have to wash it with special stuff and it's like you know and the reason why they do that is because of cost and it's still just strange that it costs less to not wash things and just throw them away but uh you know that's it's not a very uh you know ecology based economy but that's what it is and so mm -hmm. um greenland losing ice is at a, its fastest rate in 12,000 years. I'm surprised it's not already there. I, I would be equally as surprised to hear that it was just happening today. The interesting thing is I'm reading a book right now, uh, and it's not the book that you see behind me, which I'm gonna show you in a moment, and you'll, you won't be surprised at the name of that book. Uh, but the book I'm actually reading is uh, an, another apocalyptic book, which is called The Drowned World. And they're only, hold out because the entire planet is under is like mostly underwater is in greenland even though greenland is is 85 degrees oh interesting the time. but yeah. the equator is 180 degrees so and this is like one of the, the most famed authors of all time uh, so ballard who basically they coined ballardism for anything that seems apocalyptic in uh, novels because he's been doing it since the 60s, maybe even earlier. But yeah, the book actually behind me, I think you might like to, uh, to look at this. Uh, let me hold up to everybody. Notes from an Apocalypse. Nice. <laughs> heard of that one. Another one. Another one of those books. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hey, great maybe reading. Start off your day with some, some cheery reading material. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's, it's survival stuff. I mean, I guess that's yeah. how we read our, our things. And yeah, that's going to be my next such thing for that. So here's yep. another bad, bad news item. <laughs> Invasive jumping worms damage U.S. soil and threaten forests. And this is another invasive species from Japan, South, you know, Korea's yep. coming over wow. here, literally jumping going worms. through the soil. And what they leave behind is like bad soil. What? So See, we think I, I've never even heard of worms that... And they, wow, they look like earthworms, just like... They're used for bait, and yet people let them, let them go sometimes, and they 
usually, you know, and this is a thing I heard even back when people were pro or, you know, organic milk, this and that, and they had worms on their covers and like worms help the soil and, and the, and the cows eat the grass and the cows make the milk and the this or that. And everyone's excited about worms helping everything. And you're like, well, yeah, the part, worms are just irrigate the land and stuff. And, and they go, yeah. and they, they, the, the, the matter they put out is, is something that's going to help make things be uh, more fertile and stuff. But these worms, I guess, apparently not. <laughs> so it looks like that they must eat on the, like the uppermost layer of, of the soil because they feast on mulch. Um, so just under the surface, basically, yeah. just barely there. So they're taken away instead of digging down like, like our common earthworms do and getting more in there. But that's very interesting. I have never, they are very similar to earthworms. They look mm -hmm. almost identical. And um, yeah, they cause environmental harm. And it's just, and they, if you see it in a garden, they may have, dif you might have difficulty growing the plants because they're like going to disturb that precious layer of soil but that is interesting so they uh it looks like the dis because they disturb that upper layer um basically they're breaking it up and versus like earthworms that kind of dig through the more denser um sub layers so that will loosen it up so that the rainwater can wash it off and wash it away that's pretty interesting yeah. and i've tried to grow worms in like a, a vermicomposter like a red wiggler yeah. which tend to stay on the upper surface but i had never heard of them being environmentally bad and i hope not because i threw them out in my compost pile when they didn't work out but yeah, yeah. um wow interesting i have never heard of that before which is why being so in cool. a uh, well a, a fortunate yeah being in like an environment that's much like a hospital the sanitized environment that is the moon base is where we're going everybody we hope we're going and if and you're not going yeah. if you're not actually working t towards this right no one's going to it unless you're working right. towards this like i say we're teachers right now but we're scientists first and foremost and uh we can teach anywhere we can teach in any right. planet in any galaxy in any universe for hopefully <laughs> forever forever <laughs> infinity yeah, if i can make that sign infinity yeah, and I think I think the the best place to start um, our our transition to elsewhere is the moon. It's Perfect. Very let's let's head into that segment now. Right here, yeah. And so, um, living on the moon, like it's still really unfortunate that you know when you mention this to people, like even when we we're mentioning it now online, you know, there's still a little bit of just like you know that when people hear that, they're just like, oh man, you like that's like that could ever happen, like it's possible. And the truth is, yeah. yeah. And the truth is, is that like it's really possible. And you know, there have already been 24 people that have gone to the moon, and 12 people have actually walked on it. And many of those people spent the night on the moon. You know, like they they stayed there for more than one day. You know, there was like a, a camp out for three days. I think was the the longest mission. And and it's like, you know, so people did live on the moon, just a really short camping stay. You know, and yeah. you know that's a week or more in orbit and you know you know three people living together in a capsule um made it work they proved it would work you know and, and that was obviously based on like pr prior research that had to build up to that but we're here now we've got all of these awesome technologies that would make it so much more um plausible and and feasible than even the apollo missions and so um, I have a really soft spot in my heart for the Apollo missions personally, so I've been looking forward to talking about this one um, because a lot of people just say like, all right, well, why is it so hard to do this in the first place? Why is it so hard to get there? And so um, in order to, to illustrate, what I'm going to do is yeah. I'm going to actually show a little bit of a comparison. Um, and so yeah. on the right over here so we've got this is the saturn V. so this is the only rocket in the history of the world that has ever brought human beings uh to another heavenly body so that's that's what it takes and so i want to show just how impressive this is because this whole rocket is taller 
than the Statue of Liberty by a, a considerable amount. Yeah. And so on the left side here, um, there's a human to scale of just, this is the bottom of the rocket right down here. Um, and so the Saturn V consists of numerous stages. So just to explain um, how difficult it is, so there's, there was more than one million components on the Saturn V rocket. And so to have a 99% success rate on all of those components in one vehicle means that thousands of parts would fail. So that's unacceptable. You can't even have a 99% success rate for this type of vehicle. You've got to have a 99.9%, 99%, you know, because everything's yeah. got to go right. Otherwise, you know, these three people could very easily die. So here we've got one person to scale on the size of this rocket. So as we, we scroll up, we see the first stage. So SIC, that's the, the first stage. And it holds a ton and of fuel. So there are two different tanks for fuel. Um, and I think it drinks fuel like um, an Olympic swimming pool every minute. And this first stage only lasts for a little, a little under three minutes. And then it breaks off and falls away. And so then it's pushed by the second stage, which in itself, just like the first stage, is only fuel tanks and engines. Yeah. So this is just fuel tanks and engines, very little anything else. And it pushes this craft higher for another uh, seven minutes. And then it also dis dis uh, detaches and falls back to Earth and burns up in the atmosphere. And then this third stage um, is what pushes them to the moon. So this one shuts off at 11 minutes, 11 and a half minutes into the flight. Um, but it's going to get restarted later. So it pushes for a little while, and then two hours into the flight, they fire up the motor again, to, and it's called translunar injection. This is how they get to the moon. This little, this little one engine pushes them to the moon. And then you have the lunar module. Now, that's the spacecraft that they actually got into to get to the moon, and it's disposable. So it's attached to the command module, which is this tiny triangle up here and in that tiny triangle is where the three people live hmm. and so on the right side again this this big picture way at the top you can't even see it is the tiny little capsule and the little lunar module that is what all of this fuel has to push to the moon so it takes all of that fuel just to get those two spacecraft or three really um, into moon or uh, lunar orbit, and so why haven't why is it so difficult? Well, number one, cost yeah, because yeah. that alone um, costs somewhere around like two hundred in today's dollars, two hundred and eighty-five billion dollars, which sounds like a lot of money, except when you think about other government projects. Like right now, I, I guarantee you that the race for this vaccine. Um, will probably end up as costly as the Manhattan Project or the Apollo Project. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's possible for us to do. But it's, um, you know, it's expensive. And so that's the reason why we aren't there. That's why it's um, the number one reason why um, it's so difficult to do is because it, it costs $10,000 per pound hmm. just to get something to orbit around the Earth, not even to the moon. And then, um, you know, it's everything on top of that is more expensive. And nowadays, we're going to take less than the 60s to get to the moon. Yeah. So, you know, there's going to be some safety costs there. But we can get it back. And the way to get it back is going to be through primarily education, yeah. teaching people that we've done this, teach them the technology behind it. Because as soon as I, I, I taught myself um, about, the Apollo missions before I ever went to school for it. And um, when I learned about how it's like, it's like camping and technology, the fastest vehicles ever made, um, and pyrotechnics and all of these cool things all mixed into one, I was engrossed in it. And I was, you know, just a freshman in high school or even younger. And so, um, you know, if we educate kids about this, 
they're going to grow up looking towards this, you know, maybe more than like a football player or their, you know, favorite basketball player. Like, sure, that's cool. But like, how about this stuff that actually pushes humanity forward versus yeah. just scoring some points and making a million dollars? You know, um, so the reason why we don't have the education that will cause us to go back is because of a lack of enthusiasm. As soon as uh, Apollo 11, you know, put people on the moon, people forgot about Apollo 12. And by Apollo 13, they weren't even doing the live feed of the, uh, you know, of the, from the mission, like while they were en route to the, the moon, like no networks were even sharing their videos anymore. Like people were already spent. And then we had Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17 all go to the moon. And it was, you know, it was just seen as a large expensive science experiment, but the purpose of those missions were to set up a, um, yeah. a long-term lunar base called, um, you know, I think it was, uh, it ha it's by law it has to be called the Neil Armstrong lunar base or something like that. Huh. Um, hey, I like that name. <laughs> I know, I know. And so strong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's possible to go back and we really need to, especially because like you and I talk about, um, life extension. Um, part of life extension is keeping the human race, you know, alive. Like, because yeah, yeah. it's one thing, you know, we could say, yeah, it's easy for us to download our brains or something you know someday in the future hopefully it's easy to do it but download your brain into a computer what happens if the computer gets blown up because of some war happening down here on earth like part of that is is keeping um humanity itself alive and as, as well as the individual um and i think that that's it's just part of it and the moon is the very first stepping stone to the planets and to the stars and so if there's ever been anything that's that humanity should do it's explore um that's how we got here that's where we why we're across the globe but um we need to keep keep it going i'd say yeah and and once we're on the moon like you mentioned with the fuel issues of getting off of earth it's going to be easier to get off the moon into space than it is i mean it's going to be so easy i mean that could just even the way i've seen videos is literally <laughs> Someone could push you up into the into the into space, and you'd be like, "Bye." Yeah. Not go. quite that easy. Not yeah. quite that easy on the moon per se. On an asteroid, easily you you could probably jump and end up uh, uh, with escape velocity. I yeah. don't know what is. I forget what escape velocity is on the moon. I got to find this, but um, but no, it's exponentially easier um, because there's no atmosphere yeah. to to climb out of. And that's a huge obstacle. And so if we're going to go to Mars, we might as well figure out how to live on the moon, which is only 250,000 miles away, you know, then going all the way to Mars, which you can only get to like between a six to nine month travel at like the right time of year, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, um, it's, it's a natural next step. Yeah. And, um, so 2.38 kilometers per second. So that's a pretty good clip. So what is that? Probably somewhere around, I'm trying to think. It's a couple thousand miles per hour at least, I think. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta go pretty fast still off from, off from the moon to make it into orbit, but it's not. So 17,500 miles an hour, which is the escape velocity of, of the Earth. Yeah. So it's, I'll bet you it's one-sixth of the... Uh, uh, escape velocity of the earth because that's the size of the moon so somewhere around there and it's inter interesting when for anybody who, who's not privy to all these things where you're mentioning that may say escape velocity they're like yeah it literally is escaping escaping this planet and yep. the, the planet gravity all these other the, the friction the, the the everything need wants to keep you here literally yeah like to get away from this it takes so many forces and then once you've escaped it i mean everything opens up and well, uh once once you escape earth velo i mean um so you you've got uh the escape velocity to get to orbit yeah but to get somewhere else you always have to remember you're always in orbit around something else yeah so if you're not in earth orbit you can go to lunar orbit but if you like really power out of earth orbit, you end up in a solar orbit. 
and then to try to escape the force of the sun to try to go fast enough to get to like jupiter you know that's another order of magnitude harder but what's even harder than that is to try to go from earth to the sun it takes way more energy to slow down and fall towards the sun than it yeah. does to actually escape to the outer planets which is is Pretty it's literally like someone being on a on a carousel and they're, you're holding on, they're spinning it, and it's trying to pull you off, and you're trying to get to the center, and it's it's yeah. We also have other things too, like where you can, um, so uh, velocity assist by an entire planet. Yeah. So, uh, say you're on a spacecraft and you want to go to lunar orbit. Um, so you dip in close to the earth and the gravity kind of pulls you in as if you were shortening a rope, like on a, like a, like if you're swinging around yeah. and you shorten the rope, it speeds up, right? So this speeds up your spacecraft and sends you hurtling off even faster. But the funny thing is that every time you do that, you actually slow the planet down by a fraction of, you know, a mile per hour or whatever. So, um, we do that often where we, we use it the gravity assist of another planet to get our craft to, you know, a further planet. And um, it's just interesting in the, with the math, it means, you know, there's no loss of energy anywhere. So it means that you had to have slowed, slowed that planet down a little bit for you to gain that speed. It's crazy. So next little subject, and this is, and, and this is the same exact thing. We're still saying with this, this is going to be part one, I think of our series of, because there's so much to talk about the moon, but I want to, I want to give sort of like what life could possibly look like on the moon. So I think we need to definitely think of ourselves as it's like camping. It's literally like, like how can you function in a small space for a very long time, survive, uh, be friendly, like for a very long time with other people, work together, like literally be completely dependent on the work of another person. If they don't do their job, there's chances that you could die. Yeah. Like having, you cannot cross every T and dot every I by yourself. You just, you absolutely have to have other people working for that with you to, to make, you all live and they've done this on on earth all the time they uh they've done biodomes where people lock themselves in for like months and see if they can survive without any air coming in or out based you know with plants and stuff in the air and it's worked uh one time there was a leak or something they needed to get out but uh, but they had another one and it worked worked out but they they constantly measured how much of what you know, gases they needed and stuff. And it's going to be the exact same thing here. So yeah, the first thing no, absolutely. would be schedules need to be kept, right? Growing schedules, schedules for what buttons or what need to be pushed. Oxygen is going to be replenished, recycled. When you look at the, so I've in part of my education was like looking at the schedules, like crew rotation schedules and things like that on the, international space station and every minute is precious every second is precious and it's like even the astronauts in the station they're given five minutes to exchange the air filters or something like that well they want to do it in four minutes 30 seconds because it means that they've got 30 extra seconds that they can put into something somewhere else and it's just like yeah. this constant you're you are on a schedule every moment of your life if you're an astronaut has meaning and purpose and like enormous financial support behind it so you better use it efficiently and that's absolutely scheduling is is huge and that's why not everybody can could be could do this you know you gotta be someone that can exist on a schedule um and the psychology of being on a schedule is, is a lot different the psychology of getting along with people because if someone starts getting lazy you know yeah, human yeah. psychology you're gonna have resentment it'll cause conflict you can't have that. So absolutely, schedule's got to be met. I always think think of it as a way as you constantly, you have so many things you want to do and you're constantly questioning yourself. So this sort of life, I did something. I was able to do it faster. Why was I able to do it faster? Am I going to keep getting faster at it? Did I mess up? 
constantly this, these checks and balances constantly going on in your head because you know, you'll know the consequences of not doing something and you'll know how large that could be and what that could mean. And it's not like you can just walk outside and take a breather. I mean, you're completely dependent on these machines and yep. technology to keep you alive. And we might have to start thinking about that here on our planet. I mean, with viruses, diseases, with uh, insects, is- animals, things just like the climate change, everything, it's going to turn into that already. So this is kind of like, no. get used I remember to that, it. I mean, somewhere around like third or fourth grade, I remember reading about um, the Gemini missions and um, this cramped cabin that they stayed in for days. And so we just happened to get a refrigerator that, you know, somewhere around that time period. And I cut a hole in it and I pretended it was my space capsule. I got in and closed the door and tried to sleep in there for one night and it didn't work. I was like out of there in my bed. And it's like, you know, you have to have this, this motivation behind you to, to, to do it. And, you know, a kid in a cardboard box is one thing, but like when you're out there doing it for real, yeah. um, you know, you've got to have the, the motivation behind you because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an unreal amount of expectation and reliance on other people. And it's, um, it's actually a really beautiful thing when it works out because, you know, everyone's kind of bored with NASA. No one under, no one knows the names of the astronauts flying around the earth right now. Um, but that's because they've done such a good job of not making it full of drama because okay. everyone's such a, it's, it's just so spot on and they are precision every day. They, they analyze everything that they do and they make it better. And so everything's more efficient. You know, yep. the way that they're going to work next year is going to be more efficient than last year because everybody's on the same page working for the same thing. And it's, it's really a, a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. And that's the one thing you mentioned, motivation to make things better for everybody. So right. everybody, if you're living, say, that, you know, living on the moon, it's going to be much like uh, the International Space Station. You're just not floating around somewhere. I mean, and honestly, right. if, if we can make a, uh, a building on Antarctica, in Antarctica, if we can have a building on Mount Washington that can survive the weather there, we can have something on the moon, which is just, you can't go outside. I mean, that yep. often without putting on the crazy suit and everything, but it's this motivation that everything you do has an impact. Everything you do that might be different than anyone has ever done before is something that is logged here. Everyone's analyzing it. And if yep. it works, it works for you. It could work for the next person. It's like take, so one person takes one step and then goes back inside and they go, I took a step and they go, you're alive. I'm yep. going to go out there and take the same step you took and take one extra step. And then that well, person takes the next step. And it's a, a bunch of these firsts that are like groundbreaking until we can actually do things that seem more like what we do on Earth. After, after Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon and, and said the famous words, uh, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he jumped back onto the lunar lander leg. So he literally took one step, jumped back on, just to make sure, just to try it out, just in case, because they didn't know what the consistency of the sand, you know, the regular oh, yeah. was going to be like. Yeah. And they, there was actual real thought that there was, there could be these traps, you know, because of the gravity that oh, you yeah. step in it and it, it's like quicksand, you know. So it really was a first step, jump back to safety. Then they went out and they worked for a couple, like I think it was maybe an hour and a half to two hours back in the LM. And back off towards earth and the next one showed up for a few more hours and the next one then 13 didn't work out and then 14 came stayed for longer then 15 came and they brought a car you know like so they built off from it and you know that was seen as as a huge renovation is the stepping stone mentality and you don't do an all-up test all the time you work towards it and so when you have that mentality and you realize you're one of the first people you know you're like all right yeah sure like things aren't the best for me right now how can i make it better for the the next people behind me and i feel like you know we should already be in that mindset here on earth because this is spaceship earth after all and um you know we should be thinking how can i leave this 
place better for the people behind me, but you know, nice Buckminster Fuller quote. Yeah, right. right. My, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the other thing you see with it. I, I was thinking of like, he's stepping on, on the, the moon and me, I didn't see, I see the sand there. I'm instantly thinking of the movie Dune and I'm like, Oh no, these giant worms are going to come and yeah. suck me in. Or it's like star Wars and stuff like that. Some of those planets that were just all dunes and stuff like that. The lava tubes. That's, yeah. that's one of, one of the things too. Like if you step over a lava tube, like look like basically a wormhole, you know, mm-hmm. it, like, you know, and, there you go. You're gone. You know, so obviously there was some fear there, but they I definitely have found rope that or was... something hooked on to me that basically could pull me up. It's yeah. Serious. Right. And then, <laughs> so this I- other idea on the moon that you'd have better health. I mean, we understand the issues of radiation, all the stuff. Let's just say, let's just say this stuff's taken care of because obviously if people are going to be living there a long time, you're going to be living between like a few feet of lead and whatever else to keep radiation away and whatever they need for that sort of thing but with a schedule you'll have better health absolutely you're going to have better health because every single thing you're going to have things measured every single day that you would never have thought of on earth maybe once a year maybe once every five years measured on earth you can be measuring that every single day like am i healthy can i am i able to do this am i getting everything i need for nutrients you can have a motivation to be have better health because you are going to be busy keeping up after so many other things that y- you don't have time to like get sick. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure does anybody in the space, you shouldn't be getting colds. They're not getting colds no. from anybody because they're, they're already healthy and they're just, you know, everything's been dialed in. Like you cannot get sick. So you're going to be taking care of yourself. And this is also just this healthy fear of not, of like, of not surviving. So the fear yeah. of like, not just you dying, but you, your death, meaning the death of others because you're not there to fill your part. Mm-hmm. And that's like a, a, a big motivator. Like, wait a minute, I can't, I can't do this. And I, and honestly, I feel like throughout history, throughout everything I've read about uh, the, the people that have lived longer, it's not just this health consciousness. It's not just, the active lifestyle it's also the fact that they have a mission and those that have a mission live longer they have this motivation that keeps them alive I, I, and, and this is going to keep people alive i would agree and one thing just one um you know like nasa had to select the fittest you know people for these missions because if you think about it you got two people on the surface and the one guy circling around the earth waiting for those two guys to come back if he's got heart disease, has a heart attack, you know, they literally, it killed two others. Yeah. You know, if he had some gastrointestinal issue that just flared up, you know, if he wasn't scanned before doing it, just one guy, like these two other guys on the ground that everybody knows their name, you know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, nobody knows the name of that guy that was yeah. circling around. Few people do, you know, a few people, hopefully a few people watching, but um, I do. And it's Mike Collins and, if it, if it wasn't for him being fit, healthy, um, having that mission in life to do what he did, you know, some stuff could have happened that wouldn't have gotten him back or he wouldn't have been selected for the play. Yeah. And it's just, that's that whole thing. And, and it's one of those things where I want humans to be able to get themselves to this optimal level. Uh, and I don't think, and obviously we can't do it on our own with genetics and, and predispositions you get you're born and you have just certain things in your dna that that are against you living longer and stuff like that we need to find a way to fix that so that we can be these super healthy beings that can do much more important work than to worry about our health and worry about pithy matters that don't shouldn't be really concerning to us it should be these giant questions answered and not Oh no, I need to eat this certain thing. And oh no, did I need to do this? I need to, no, it should just be, we should be able to be healthy and maintain that while taking care of real important issues. I mean, we all, we've all wanted that. Even as kids, we've all wanted to, come on, I should be able to eat candy and just, I'm full and I get protein and I get everything I need. My body shouldn't react like it does if I eat too much candy. You know, we all wanted that. And someday hopefully we can we can get that way so it shouldn't make us lazy it should just make us we know what our body needs and yeah 
we've got more important things. Listen, I got to do this physics experiment. That's so important. It's more important that I do this experiment than I need to worry about eating something or whatever, than I need to, to rest at this point. So I take this pill and this, this injection and there you go. I'm good yeah. for the next six hours. And you probably will need a plant-based diet on the moon, right? Because you can grow plants. Definitely would need a plant-based diet. And I mean, with, you know, perhaps supplemented with some like rations from earth, you know, yeah. if there's a supply chain, but you know, honestly, it's probably better off if you have a plant-based diet. Um, so I was in, you know, not the business of, but I was learning about growing food in the spacecraft environment. Um, that was my thesis paper for college because um, it didn't make sense to bring chickens to space. It makes yeah. sense to bring seeds to space, you know, and, it, and it's where are you going to, you're going to get more out of uh, this plant-based diet. And if you're on the moon, um, well, I should say on Mars, they found that the, the, the soil with a little bit of working is uh, able to produce uh, food like you could plant seeds in it so you know we can mm -hmm. figure this out on the moon too for sure but uh, but definitely plant-based diet and um you you've gotta you gotta stay alive while you're there so if you don't eat red meat while you're there you're probably going to be in uh, better shape in the long run anyway so you know less cheese <laughs> you know, things, let's cholesterol. Yeah, things that can just say, you know, you're going to do, be doing exercise anyways. We already know it, the, your bones yep. have yep. space because they're not, and your muscles are kind of wasting because they're not being used as much. So you're going to find a way to tie yourself down. Would be way more important on and do the stuff. Moon. And I mean, during your day, you're mining for resources. I mean, you're exploring for humanity. You're doing so many important things that like every day is a first for humanity. Mm -hmm. literally so this it should just be an, a no-brainer that the absolute best diet and 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 routine just to keep your body so you can do the more important things that should just be automatic it should just happen like that and of course we've got you know science that, that backs certain things but at the same time if all you could eat in space was candy they'd have to make candy extra super nutritious for you too because i mean yep you have to do what you have to do to survive. And since, since the fifties, we've been looking for those for, for pills, right? Like yeah. even in the fifties, especially with accelerated with the, the space exploration industry was the secret to finding nutrition that you could a little lightweight pill you pop and it takes care of everything you need. And unfortunately we're still, we're searching for that. But as of right now, all of the evidence shows that at least plants and plant-based diet uh, can can work. And so, would, how cool would it be? I wanted to be the first farmer on the moon to do the first harvest of yeah. whatever it would be on the moon. You know, like probably legumes, something like really dense. These you know, beets like, are so delicious. Yeah, lunar beets, exactly. lunar beets are so delicious. I know. I wanted to be the first farmer on the moon, and you know, maybe someday I can be. We'll see. Yeah, and I and I guess and and there's another thing in uh, bringing builders up first with scientists that literally their job is to just keep the builders healthy so they can keep building and just yep. build 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 something that is like the biggest building that's ever been constructed something that looks like uh, uh the louvre Mu museum or bigger that can and support life and can have s hospitals and have everything in there and just keep building build 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 have come people come in and keep renovating inside make it so it can it's completely impenetrable from all these things and just have scientists there that just keep these builders alive so that they Absolutely. can keep doing what they do and that should and that's be the part, first thing happening it has to be because um that's part of this the issue you don't you can't take a building with you you know from earth to the moon so it's something called uh, in situ resource acquisition so mm -hmm. you have to be in the location, use the resources available to you to construct something. So um, naturally speaking, you get to the moon, you've got nothing but regolith. It's just, so regolith is just this different layers of just crushed rock, Some, sometimes to the point where it's so fine and razor sharp that it like damages suits and things like that. So a lot of the people are going to be thinking about building in lava tubes and, and stuff like that, but you're going to have builders that can come take this resource, turn it in, into a livable structure somehow. And, 
uh, someday we, we got to do a, when we have more time, we can do a deep dive on the exact, like the hows, we, how we are going to um, do in situ resource acquisition. Yeah, I think that'd be like part two. We can get into yeah. that thing. So, and, and then the last big thing about this, this, this segment is just uh, everything is going to be a first. So the first person to go to, you know, do anything up there. I'm the first person to skateboard inside on the moon. I'm the first person to do this on the moon, to do that on the moon, have a baby like on music. the moon. The first yeah. person to play music on the moon, you know, like, yeah. you know, something like that, you know, like. The, the, Wikipedia is going to be exploding with so many <laughs> firsts and stuff. Yeah. And then it's going to become not that important. But that's what we want. You want yeah. it to happen so that so many people have done it that it's like it's been proven to be safe. And so it's constantly going to build up there. I mean, to have a city on the moon of giant interconnected buildings and tubes and something that's been, we know it's safe and they, people are constantly checking on it. And, and, and maybe people are happier. Maybe this is a different economy up there. And, they found a way to make it uh, much like uh, our beloved Venus project that we talked about that everyone can uh, look, I'll, I'll put a link to it. Please look up the Venus project. Yeah, absolutely. That could be on the moon. Things where, where everyone's like, we have different economy and, and, and people treat people differently. And it's just an understanding that you were all, we're here, we're, we're pioneers. We're doing this for everybody. And we, we don't need to, we don't need wars. We don't need, you know, maybe even religions may be banned. Maybe so, anything that, that, that tries to denote someone being better than another person. No, that's out of there. We have to all be interconnected. We're all humans and we need, we need to make this work for everybody and for the planet. And, and there's a timeline and time's running out. We need to do this. That's true. I mean, yep, we needed to do we this 50 years ago. And it's like, if anyone could, everyone could send a dollar, I guess, to NASA, everybody in the world, yep. and send a dollar every single week, forever, maybe they can do something with it. And as of right now, the average taxpayer spends less than a penny on NASA every year. And so if we all paid a dollar, like right now there's a push for a penny for NASA. If everybody just paid a penny of their taxes to NASA how awesome would that be but if we just stepped it up to a dollar and like we were committed to this goal we could literally do everything that we want to do with this with you know our species so we definitely have got to revisit this some more yeah um i think we're getting out of time though that our spacex we're gonna do that spacex so maybe we'll talk about spacex right. next time as well because they're well, uh... like so you were saying like we got to make it happen so often that it becomes boring it's like 10 years ago people would have told you that landing a booster that had just put a satellite into space was absolutely impossible and you were ridiculous for even su like suggesting the idea and now spacex has done it so often that people are just like yawn we'll just yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. we know we can do that whatever yeah <laughs> it's just like sorry it's still amazing it's still, it is still amazing. amazing yeah <laughs> and that's that's like that's the thing and i mean this is and I'm, I'm glad we were able to talk about this just today because it's like we're getting sick of talking about teaching in school while COVID takes over Ugh. and stuff. And we're, we know every day, always more. We just wonder when our school is going to shut down and we're going to go virtual. And our schedules change all the time. It changed this week again. Yep. So, and, you know, it's, we have our little issues day to day, but it's the thing is we're still teachers. We're still pushing forward to help yeah. students in any way we possibly can. And yep. there's just this, we don't know what to do. You know, there's a lot of money somewhere that, that we are not in charge of, that others are in charge of, that honestly, they don't know what to do with it because, yep. and they're just kind of willy nilly spending because it's, we don't know what to do. And there's yep. so many things we could complain about, like every single person on social media right now, but it's just, we're bored with that. It's time yeah. for uh, the big ideas that we set out to do in this podcast originally, right. rather than focus on our day-to-day -day stuff. I mean, we're probably going to be online soon, so whatever. We're going to function. We've, we've been working hard these past three weeks. So That's right. It's been such a, like, just, just for a few minutes tonight, we were able to forget 
that there yeah. was a pandemic out there while I was talking about the things that I thought I would be talking about for the rest of my life. And so it's nice to be able to return and talk about these things that I uh, um, literally want to be the things that I talk about for the rest of my life, yeah. not this stupid pandemic. So, <laughs> And hopefully, hopefully this is what, why you came, guys, to this channel to watch us, to subscribe to us. Do what you can. I don't. I, we don't mention this as much. We just put it in the credits and stuff like that. But please subscribe, like, share, enjoy what we're doing. Find the podcast if you do, don't want to look at us. But uh, I don't think we look that bad. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, we're gonna get better cameras. Don't worry. I don't know how good we can do streaming on Zoom, but we'll find the four eight K whatever we need to get for this to make we'll, it work. We'll we'll figure it out and uh improve, you know, which is part of the uh engineering design methods uh, process. So uh yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Well I'm Mr. James. And I'm Mr. Richie. And we, we are, are the, the educators. educators. And we're going to space everybody. Turn right. Have a good night.